Hi folks, welcome to the first in a brand new series of the BIH show. Quite a different format from what we had before with our audio show last year, but it's the elite series, we've got to do something a little bit special. I'm Craig Anderson, taking you through the competition as we go through the weeks. We'll get some great guests on, we'll get their thoughts on what's happening from events in Nottingham. On this week's show, Mark Lefebvre joins us to look ahead to the competition, as does BBC commentator Seth Bennett as well, as we look over the teams and way up who could win the Elite Series. We also get some insight from Alex Forbes of Coventry Blaze as he tells us about what's happening with his team as they look ahead to the first game against Manchester Storm this weekend. But in the meantime, enjoy the BIH show. And first up, here's Mark Lefebvre. Mexico. Mark, how are you getting on, first of all? Good, thank you. I'm good. Um, you know, just having a nice relaxing time right now, end of the season, and uh, getting ready for what's next to come. Now, before we get into the, the Elite Series, obviously, oh, there's a dog in the background there, just taking a look. Um, <laughs> no longer with Odense Bulldogs, you had a couple of years there. How do you reflect on your, your time in Denmark? Oh, it was interesting two years. Uh, learned a lot, uh, but I'm proud of the job we did there. We had a, It's definitely a different setup than I'm, what I'm used to, whether it was in the East Coast or in the UK. Um, it's more of an amateur setup than anything. Um, your players aren't always full time. There's some of them work uh, full time jobs as well. Then they come to training. You know, training at four o'clock in the afternoon is a little bit different. And you have mainly volunteers uh, in your backroom staff instead of full time employees. But uh, overall, it's a great learning experience. Uh, we improved the team by points wise in the standings uh, both years I was there. So. Um, you know, we had a young team, probably lowest budget in the league by a far country mile. But, uh, you know, uh, like I said, great learning experience and uh, on to the next uh, next journey. Any likelihood and where that's likely to be? Any any thoughts on what you want to do? <laughs> There's a lot of tire kicking going on right now. But, uh, no, I've <laughs> talked to a few teams already. And, um, you know, hopefully, you know, I'd like to get over with the, some done sooner rather than later. But uh, right now, this is at the start of the process um, with a couple teams right now and seeing where that thing, where, the, where those things go. But uh, good stuff. Well, we'll get you on to talk about the Elite Series. Obviously, that starts on Saturday. Um, huge over here in the UK, obviously. I know you keep a close eye on, on things over here. The four teams involved, Coventry Blaze, Sheffield Steelers, Manchester Storm and, and Nottingham Panthers. Um, what was your reaction to the news that a tournament was going to start, that we were going to see something of a 2020-21 season? Well, I think it's great. I think it's great for the four teams involved, but I think it's great for the whole league in general. I think uh, it's massive for GB too for their setup, uh, getting ready for the World Championships. I know they want to get their players on the ice in some kind of competitive format. And, um, I think it's just great for the UK overall to, to get the, the players back on the ice, whether they're imports or British players. Because yeah, I, I know fans have been clamoring for ice hockey for the whole season. I know uh, they were bummed out when things got cancelled last season. Now we're, we're more than a calendar year. Um, into this pandemic and uh, they're finally going to see some light at the end of the tunnel or some hockey starting this weekend. And of course, it's, it's a short window for players as well. I've heard Guy Doucette talk a lot from the Nottingham Panthers point of view about giving guys an opportunity over here with maybe a view to next season as well. For many players, it, it's that kind of chance for them, isn't it? To see if they can impress and maybe stay here a bit longer. Well, it definitely gives these four teams an advantage over the other six teams, uh, you know, get them ahead of the game. And maybe th they can poach some British players as well off the other clubs, um, you know, for next season. But, um, you know, no matter what jersey they're wearing, I think it's just a great, uh, great situation for everybody involved. And, and going back to the original question, it's great for these coaches and GMs to be able to evaluate, uh, evaluate the players and um, see what they can bring to the table uh, going into next season. Now, I dare say you would have kept an eye on the draft um, when it was it was a few weeks ago now. Todd Kelman presided over um, the first ever Elite League draft. What did you make of that? How exciting was it to, to see something like that going on in this country? Uh, it was definitely different, um, but I, I think it was, a, it was a positive outcome for everybody involved. And uh, I think uh, Killer tried to make it as entertaining as he could uh, for the most part and for the four teams involved as well. And, um and for the fans obviously tuned in and and you know it's always see, uh different to see when you see a guy like Bounds he's going to Nottingham you know and and Maddie Myers going to a place like Sheffield like that so it's definitely uh interesting to see I'm, I'm sure some Carter fans and that weren't too happy to see them uh get chosen by those teams but uh it definitely gave some different to the league 
Now, we've seen an influx of Norwegian players as well. Obviously, the, the league over there has been shut down because of the, the pandemic and, and all that's gone on with that. How much will they make an impact on, on the series as we look ahead? Well, I don't know much a lot uh, about the Norwegian league. I know their season got cancelled, but they've been training since January uh, when games got stopped there. But uh, So they'll be in pretty good shape. And uh, Norway's always got their team in the, in the A pool at the World Championships. So... I think the players coming over will be quality players. And obviously it's a different game in the UK than, than most teams are set up for, but uh, you know, they're probably looking to make an impact in this league as well. And uh, it goes back to what we talked about, uh, allows these other four teams uh, that are involved to evaluate these players as well. So let's discuss the teams and the four teams taking part. We'll start with your old team, Coventry Blaze. Danny Stewart has done what I think is a, is a very good job recruiting the players um, that he's brought in. Some some notable ones, Mike Hammond was one of the players brought in uh, in the draft, as was Sam Duggan. A um, couple of, um, sort of wild cards, if you can call them that, brought in from the, the NIHL, Ivan Antonov from the Bees, Austin Mitchell King, who did well with Telford Tigers. Overall, what do you think of Danny's team? Well, I think it's going to be a blue collar working team. Like uh, I think they had a very good season overall last year before the pandemic kicked in. I think they got the third in the table and it seems to be the blueprint for this team going into it as well with a couple of players coming from the NCAA they're going to make it in. And I, I think they're a rough team to play. You know, getting locking in back for them, the finish guys uh, going to be a big boost for them offensively. And if they get Hammond into the lineup, uh, I know he's just coming off his season is finished on Friday night in in Denmark. So um, he'll be he may be a little bit tired at the start though, but uh, we all know what the offensive capabilities he brings to the table. So there's some guys up front that can put the puck away. And uh, but overall, I think they'll be a, a 200 foot team for sure. Now, of course, it's a Coventry team who ended 1920 in third place. They were the, very much the team in form before the shutdown. And I think Danny's tried his best to get as many of those guys back. When you look at the import signings he's brought in, Chris Polkamp um, was one of those, a, a defenseman. Um, Yanni Lakinen, who impressed um, in, the, in the forward lines as well. How important was it to have that core, given how well Coventry did last year? Well, I think it'll give them a bit of advantage. They know Danny and how Danny works. and uh, Obviously, that can bleed into the rest of the players. The new players coming in, um, they can feed off them and see what uh, what works for that club. But, um, you know, like I said earlier, I think they've, they've made some very important pickups here for this tournament. And you know, it's only five weeks long, so they got to get the chemistry right right away. And I think they've uh, done a good job there. And I like Shane Owen and that as well. I think that's uh, you know a quality pickup for them. And 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 that there, you need a guy who's going to be able to stabilize the back end and you know be that last line defense for you. And and Shane knows the league. Uh, as much as anybody right now. And um, he's had some great success in both Fife and Belfast. And I think uh, Blaze are going to count on him quite a bit. I think we're having one or two little connection problems. So apologies for um, watching. If you're experiencing those right now, we're doing our best. Right, we'll move on to Manchester Storm. Now, as we record this, Manchester have finally completed their roster. They added the final two names um, earlier. Jacob lundell Noer and Martin Grant both coming in. But again, Ryan, Ryan Finnerty, a good experience. British core in there. Ben Davis, Craig Peacock, Matt Haywood all in there. Zach Sullivan, he's brought back as well. Manchester look a much stronger team this time. Well, he knows those players too with Peacock and Hayward from his days with the clan. And, um, you know, so he wanted to get some guys in there that he knew and that were experienced as well that can uh, hit the ground running with. And um, their team top the bomb. I think, you know, the Finners team has always been a hardworking physical teams. And uh, I don't expect anything different this time around. I know they brought some guys back from last season that with Fawcett and Critchlow coming back into the lineup as well. And, um, I know they're looking to win this tournament. I know Finner's one of the guys that uh, called me quite a bit asking about players uh, for this tournament and, and what I thought they were and my thoughts on them. And, uh, you know, I think he's done a good job finding the guys that he has. I, I like the lot, latest couple pickups there for them to kind of round, round out the roster. And, uh, you know, I think they should be there right at the end as well. Um, that's the one thing with these short tournaments like that. You just never know what can happen. And um, the guy they got on net, Sean Bonner, I when I was coaching in Orlando, he was playing for Atlanta. We played those guys quite a bit, and uh, he was great for them that season. I'm not sure what's gone on the last few seasons, but uh, if you can find that form again, I think uh, you can do, do a good job for them. 
I mean, you think back to the draft, Manchester had the first pick and Ben Bound was automatically everyone's assumption um, that, that, that he would go to whoever the first pick was and they traded it away. What, what did you make of that? Well, I think there was some funny business going on there <laughs> behind the scenes, but uh, I'm not going to get too much into that. That's none of my business, but uh, I'm sure something happened behind the scenes. But, um, you know, everybody takes a different approach to these kind of things in it with a draft. Everybody's got a different strategy. Uh, everybody's got their players that they key on and, and who they want to play for them. And, um, you know, deals happen all the time at all, whether it's NHL draft or as we saw in the UK draft here, um, you know, deals can happen anywhere. So um, I'm sure it worked, it's going to work out for both teams that were involved. And of course, as, as well as the, the Norwegian guys, he's brought in Andreas Klaverstad um, comes in from Stavanger Oilers, the, the two chaps I mentioned earlier on, um, Lindell Noor and, and Martin Grand. You're looking at guys like Zach Sullivan, um, ben Solder, one of the young lads who's come in, they've been playing in the, the NIHL Spring Cup as well. So they'll come in ready to go and, and they'll they'll hit the ice in, in, in good shape, you would think. Yeah, I think it's going to be an advantage to some of the teams that, that picked up guys that have been playing that Spring Cup. I think it's given that, uh, that competitive edge back again um, that they were missing probably since they haven't played since last March, a lot of these guys. So um, just getting that competitive edge back and, and they can hit the ground running from day one uh, this weekend. Now, go to Nottingham Panthers now. Again, um, you know, Guy Doucette and Tim Wallace working together to, to bring a lot of the, the core back that they had um, last season. Drafted players that they brought in, Ben Bounds, as we spoke about, he got traded away and ended up with the Panthers. Lewis Hook, up-and-coming player. Mark Garcia, good experience, um, can play D, but can also play going forward as well. The Panthers team, on paper, looks a, a good competitive team. Well, they're always competitive, whether it's a regular season play or, or a tournament like this. Uh, you know, they're always going to put a quality team on the ice. And obviously getting a, a quality goal like Bounds, obviously, is a big step for them to start off with. And uh, obviously getting their British core back, uh, for the most part, is a big thing for them as well. So, And obviously adding the other guys from around the league. You know, Garson, I played with Garson in Edinburgh, so he's, he's been around for a long time. But like you said, he can play forward ND, and, and uh, he's been a stabilizer. Uh, you know, uh, part of some successful teams in Belfast for the last uh, decade or so. And uh, so I, I know a few people on Twitter weren't too happy about him uh, throwing a Panthers jersey at their training this morning. So, uh, yeah, but, you know, again, it's he's a competitive player as well. So I think he's going to he's going to add to the good mix there. And there's a couple of young Scottish players that have made their way to, to Panthers. Uh, Liam Stenton played a few games for Glasgow Clan last year. Craig Garrigan, and I'm not sure, I know he's played more under Omar Pasha. Was he someone you were aware of in your time in Dundee? No, I didn't uh, I didn't have him at all. I saw the name a few times last year when uh, playing for, for Pasha and that's so in Dundee, but uh, otherwise I don't know him that much. But it looked like he made a great impact for them uh, last season. And of course, the import signings that they brought in as well, three guys from Lillehammer, um, Nick Deneen, Brendan Ellis and Austin Cangelosi, if I've uh, pronounced that correctly, three guys all coming in from the same team. That'll help them. They'll help each other as well, settle into the, their new experience as well, won't they? Well, it definitely helps. And they're all quality players with quality CVs and everybody sees that. And uh, Ellis is actually a defenseman I tried to get to Dundee uh, one season about five years ago. So uh, I know what kind of quality he brings. Uh, he's obviously has some success in Norway and all three of those guys are coming from a good program in Lillehammer. So, uh, you know, uh, Nottingham, they, they've always, like I said at the start, they've always put a quality team uh, on the ice every season. And um, I don't expect anything less for this tournament. So let's go to Steelers now. Aaron Fox's team um, have, have gone quite quite big when you look at some of the names they brought in. Liam Kirk, I think, raised a few eyebrows because um, under the, the rules of the draft, he wasn't a player who we thought was going back to Steelers, but that was later explained that a deal was made for him to come back at some point. Um, but Liam Kirk has just lit the Spring Cup alive, hasn't he? 32 points in 12 games. How much of an improvement uh, is Liam Kirk going to be from what he was before he went on the, the NHL draft? Well, I think he'll feel comfortable now being back in Sheffield as well. And I think he's had a couple of good seasons in Peterborough under Rob Wilson, who's the coach there. And uh, I think he's developed them pretty well. And uh, obviously by his point totals in, that, in the Spring Cup, obviously that's just, uh, you know, he's just getting going, you know. And uh, now I think the sky's the limit for him. And I think playing a term like this, again, again, this competitive, that edge back and then uh, hopefully rolling into the World Championships is going to do him uh, a lot more good. Uh, he's going to be playing against men in that, in that tournament. And, 
Uh, no, that he hasn't before, uh, before he went to Peterborough or not, but uh, I think he's probably much bigger, much stronger than he was before. And uh, it's probably going to start to pay off now. Isn't it weird seeing Matthew Myers in a Steelers jersey? Uh, I saw some things on Twitter from the Steelers account <laughs> today. They're pretty horned up for it. Um, you know, obviously it's, it's definitely different because I, I've only known him from uh, when he played in Cardiff and obviously for Nottingham, uh, there was those, those times in there as well. And, um, you know, hey, he's a quality player. He, he's one of the best face-off guys uh, probably in the elite league history. And, uh, you know, he brings championship pedigree to the table. Um, you know, that's what Sheffield's all about. They're all about winning trophies. And, um, you know, why not bring a guy in who's got that many trophies on his CV? And of course, we've talked about Liam Kirk, Alex Grimm's another young player who's coming through, but then the other end of the scale, Jason Hewitt coming back to, to play elite league ice hockey. What did you make of that? Oh, I think it's great for him. I think his family's thrilled. I think he was filled, uh, <laughs> thrilled for it. Um, I know uh, Steelers fans are thrilled for it. So it's nice to see a player like that who's uh, very instrumental to the club's success over a you know, 10, 12 year period that um, you get a chance to try and win another trophy in, in Orange. So the tournament as a whole, it's, it's only five weeks, so the games are coming thick and fast throughout the, the, the month of April. Um, so it's going to keep us all very busy in so many respects. Any players that you think could stand out? Any players that you think could, could cause a bit of a surprise in terms of how they play and, and maybe surprise us for their performances? Well, I don't know about individual players. I just think it's guys overall that, you know, are going to mesh together right from day one. You know, you look at guys like Dowd, you know, what they can bring to the table, what Sheffield has for them. And, you know, John Phillips, you know, I think, uh, you know, he's one of the best captains in elite league history. And I think he'll get everybody to buy into the Sheffield way from day one, uh, whether it's a new guy or an old guy, he'll have everybody pulling together. You know? So, um you know, he bounds, you know, on his days as good as anybody in the elite league. And, uh, you know, like I said earlier, I think I did a great job picking him up. Um, it'll be interesting to see how the Norwegian guys do in, in, in the league competition. Um, see the, how they got that kind of small play, especially the guy right I think, I don't think there's going to be players that just stand out. I think it's more teams and and how they come together in such a short period of time. So who do you think's done the best in terms of recruitment when you look at all four of them and you, you sort of weigh them up on paper, which is really the only way you can weigh them up at this moment in time? <sighs> well, I'll probably get abused on Twitter by some people if I don't pick their team, but I, I think they've all done a good job. You know, I, Not to be Switzerland or anything like that, but I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of restraints to what you can do, you know, um, you know, you're only available. So many imports are only available. You still got leagues that are still playing. You know, do guys want to continue their seasons? Um, you know, do they want to come to the UK for five weeks? You know, trying to find imports uh, alone is, is going to be a, it was a tough job for these guys. And they, they did a great job doing it. Um, getting British players to come play for your club when they've been at a, at a different club for their whole career. Um, you can put another jersey on it. It's probably a different thing. It's probably a tough sell as well for these guys. So, I mean, all four clubs, I think, have done a tremendous job. Um, if I had to pick a winner at the end of the day, uh, I mean, probably Sheffield, maybe, I think. Um, but you don't, I can't discount the other three teams because it, it's just a short period. It's a short, short tournament. Uh, if it was a long season, like a season-wide thing, then it's totally different. But over five weeks, to, to whoever's going to come together, um, it's quicker. And uh, – so it's going to be exciting to see. I think I think it's just going to be neat to see the different dynamics of the different players on all the different teams. Um, so it's going to be great hockey. And just one more thing before we go, and I, I, this conversation came up with David Clark when I spoke to him for a piece for, for British Ice Hockey a few weeks back regarding the import level. Um, obviously, it stood at 14 in the previous full season before the, the shutdown. It's only eight in this one. Do you think there's maybe a, a case that the import level could come down, which would allow more opportunities for British players that will help the, the national team in the long run. Is it something you'd like to see happen? Well, I can go by what we did in Denmark. We were only allowed eight imports, but our team played with six. Um, you know, some teams played with four, some teams played with five. It all depends, but you have to have quality, in, in our case in Denmark, quality Danish players that fill out the rest of the roster to make it a competitive team. Um, you don't want to have a watered-down product. I think it's, I think the UK, I think, I think 12, 13 is a good number. Um, you know, I think, I think you have to make sure you have a good influx of good British players across the board for all the teams to make sure it's competitive. 
Um, if you only have eight, eight imports, are you going to be able to pay and, and find uh, 10 to 12 British players each team to pay them as full-time players? And there's a lot of different dynamics that come into it. Um, so you just got to find out. There's got to be a good balance for it. I think eight's too low for the UK, but I think 12 is the right number. Maybe 10 eventually within the next five years. I think they've got the right step uh, in growing the national team again to the A pool. I think it's putting more eyes on ice hockey in the UK. Um, so trying to restrict the import limit. I, I know talking to some teams, I don't think they want to. I think they want to keep it as is. Some teams want to lower it just for different reasons. For, and mainly, it's, I think it's a financial thing more than anything that teams want to lower it. Um, so it's kind of a damn if you do, damn if you don't. But I think I think 12 is the right number. Uh, and eventually, within five years, maybe down to 10. But you don't want to keep going down every season. Uh, I think it's going. I'll be going down too fast. I think you got to evaluate every three to four years, and make it as a, on the fifth year roll out a new plan. So it's uh, you can't run before you walk. So you got to take your time with it and really make sure you evaluate. Make sure you're developing players. But as I've been told for the last twenty years of the elite league, it's not a development league. <laughs> so you know, there's a fine balance there too. Are you are you there to put on an entertaining entertaining product for the fans? Yeah. I think that's you want to get bums in the seats, and um, so you don't want to dilute the quality either of the play. So, like I said a couple of times now, I think twelve is the right number. Well, Mark, thank you so much for joining us on the BIH show. Great to see you again. Hopefully, we might see you again here soon. That was Mark Lefebvre there, the former Coventry and Dundee coach, taking us through the teams ahead of the Elite Series. Well, we now go to Nottingham for our next guest, and this player is going to play a big part for his team in the next few weeks. Alex Forbes is back with Coventry Blaze, one of the protected players that Danny Stewart brought back for his team, and he's given us an insight into what's happening with Coventry. Alex, big week coming up. The Elite Series is finally starting. Firstly, thanks for joining us on the BIHO. How excited are you to finally get playing? Um through the moon i haven't been on the ice since about start of december till monday there so a bit rusty but everyone's just excited to get going and of course the, the four team format starts you're seeing all sorts of new players new people coming in from a coventry point of view what have you made of your new teammates that have arrived and are settling into the team well it's only day three but it's good to everyone's good and ready to go so all the new boys are gelling well. Seem like a great group of guys off the ice, which helps on the ice. So I think we'll be pretty strong. Good. Now, when hockey last finished, Coventry were in a great position, third place, and um, going really well. I think there was some momentum building. I think it was a good run of form as well going into it. Sadly, the, that that was kind of taken away from you. Do you feel like there's some kind of unfinished business when you, you look at the, the five weeks ahead? Yeah, it was very, very frustrating. We were we were on a very good roll right towards the end of the season. Unfortunately, that got stopped. But the boys that have come back to play are definitely ready to get get some revenge, as you could say. Now, you were one of Danny's uh, protected players uh, ahead of the draft. That must have given you a great uh, little confidence boost, the fact that the coach valued you that much, that he wanted you very much on your team at that point. Yeah, it's a good confidence booster after, especially after not playing for nearly a year. So it's nice to get a little, little boost there. Tell us about the, the protocols in place at the, the Motor Point Arena. What's it been like to adjust to those, and you know, basically have to watch your environment, you're in the people around you, and all the health and safety aspect of it as well. What's that been like for you? It's very. Uh, I thought it'd be harder to get used to, but just pretty easy if you just keep things simple and just remember to keep your mask on we've just got to we've got a website we have to go through every morning and take COVID tests and then get our temperature checked at the rink before you can get in it's up to the players in the end of the day isn't it so if one guy messes up for himself he messes up for everyone but everyone's I think all on the same page so I think we'll be pretty good now, the first game is against the Manchester Storm Saturday afternoon. What have you made of the, the general recruitment around the around the, the four teams that are playing? Some good, strong players coming in, I think. I think so, yeah. I think each team's done probably I think, a good job, especially giving young Brits a chance. But 
I haven't really had a, a look at any of the imports in the other teams just because you don't know the new guys they're signing because you've never seen them play. But I'm sure each team will be strong, but I think it will be just as strong, if not stronger. Now, remember when you, you first went to Coventry, it doesn't seem that long ago now, but do you feel like one no. of the more experienced heads in the in the locker room now when you, you think back in the time you've been there? Yeah, I started there two seasons ago. This will be my third. This would have been the third season with the group, but no, I definitely feel like I've gained more confidence playing at this level and just mature, obviously, with age and experience has grown a lot over the few years. Good coaching staff and great guys in the room help, obviously, too. And of course, I think a lot of the onus on this competition was the fact that Great Britain are taking part in the World Championships at the end of it. Big opportunity for everyone involved. I dare say you've got that vision yourself, Alex. How much would you like to be considered for the World Championships uh, later in the year? Oh, I'd love to go over and play in Latvia with all the GB boys, but just going to take it game by game. I'm not going to worry about that. Just now I'm going to play my game and just see how it goes from there on. Now, as I speak to you, I think it's it's clear from your background. It looks as though you're in a hotel room. What's that been like for you and the guys to to basically hunker down there for the next few weeks? How's uh, how are you all settling in? The hotel is actually really good. It's got a really good setup. Each team's on uh, got their own floor, so it's not like we're mixed through each other. Each team's got their own meal times, so each just go in, get your meal, leave back up to your room. It's pretty good. There's Big room. I thought it would be a bit smaller, but no, it's good setup. Happy with it. Internet's good. You were saying that tonight it was good there, but you were saying that maybe one or two of the boys are, are getting stuck into their PlayStations or their Xboxes right now as well. Yeah, everyone's everyone took everyone was prepared. <laughs> what about you? What do you do in your downtime then, Alex? Obviously, you know, stuck in a hotel room, we've all done it. It can get a little bit tedious at times. What are you doing to to while away the time other than well, speak to me right now? Just speaking to family at home and just been playing the Xbox with the boys, really. Just trying to rest, but watch the Netflix. <laughs> and so, as I say, going back into into the ice hockey arena again, what has it been like for you over the last year? We had the lockdown last March. It took us up to about June. We've been in and out of lockdowns ever since. It's just been one thing after another. How have you found a way to keep positive in the last 12 months? Um, just... I always knew it was going to come back. It was just a matter of when it was going to come back. Um, I had some ice up in Inverness, well, north of Scotland there for three months, once a week, and then that got shut down, obviously, with the rules different up there down compared to England. But just I just knew it was going to come back. I just tried to keep fit and be ready for when it did come back. I didn't know it would come back this soon, but I'm happy it is. Coventry Blazes, Alex Forbes there joining us, giving us the insight into what's happening in Nottingham with the Blaze. Our final guest this week is a man well known to us really for his voice more than anything. He's a former Elite League media officer, now a BBC commentator, of course. He's commentated at the Olympics and everything. Seth Bennett is joining us to look ahead to the series as well. Gives us his insights and how he thinks the next few weeks will happen. Joining me now on the BIH show is the BBC commentator. As you can see, Seth Bennett is with us. Seth, good to have you on board. Well, what a 12 months it's been. We're finally starting to see some action again. I know, it's amazing, isn't it, to think that all of this time, over a year since we've seen any top flight hockey going, there's been various other different events that have gone on which have been useful and have been very, very important for the sport. But whether that's at the elite level or, you know, I'm coaching kids now at the under-13s level there, you know, it's the thought of going back on the ice and the thought of seeing live hockey again is hugely exciting, I think. Now, the Elite Series itself has, has sort of been a long time in coming. We had the delays over whether the regular season would start in September. It was announced it wouldn't be starting. And Tony Smith kept saying the possibility of a, of a short format tournament, which finally has come through in the, the Elite Series. What was your reaction when you, you heard the news that, yeah, hockey was coming? Great news for Great Britain. I think that's the, the biggest thing, isn't it? With the World Championships not so far away. And to know that GB were, were so, so desperate to get some game time for, for the majority of their team. And if you think that they were the, this was the only professional league that wouldn't have had any hockey that's in that top tournament of the World Championships. So huge for GB, but also great for the teams as well. 
you know, the teams that are able to compete. And I know it's been different in Northern Ireland and in Scotland and in, in Wales in terms of funding that the clubs have received at different times from their various governments, the localised governments. And <clears throat> I think that for the English teams, I think there was always a question as to what were they going to have to do to get some money to try and protect their business? How much was it going to cost to come back? And I think it's very brave because, look, Craig, make no bones about this. These teams aren't necessarily going to make a ton of money out of this. If they, if they make a small loss out of this, then I think they've done very, very well indeed. And it's a brave thing to do, isn't it? How many times have you and I been told, this is a bums-on-seat sport? Clubs have absolutely lived and died by that mantra. Well, now all of a sudden they're trying something completely and utterly different. Yes, they are going to have a little bit of financial help coming from elsewhere, but there's still a huge amount of risks to putting together, you know, four-line teams, having players come in on short notice. I think the recruitment, Craig, has been more difficult than any of the coaches imagined at this point. Um, but they've done it and they're now ready to go. And it, it's, it's hugely exciting. I think Saturday night, I'm going to be quite happy to be sitting in front of my telly with the log fire going because we're going to re-enter winter again very, very soon and get the hockey on the telly. And of course, you're used to commentating on, on big events. You've been to World Championships, playoff finals and such like as well. I mean, this is a big event. Let's not, you know, let's not um, get overhyped about it. But the fact it's going to be played in an empty arena, that's going to be strange for everybody involved, isn't it? It is. It's going to be really, really different. And the question I'm going to have for the commentators is, how are you going to be able to work off the crowd that isn't there? You know, in, in your own mind, how are you going to get excited? How are you going to raise your voice? Which usually, you know, as well as anybody, that you're going to use your voice to fight with the crowd, to bring that better performance out of you, to celebrate that goal or to, to call that goal. So that's going to be a big challenge. But what I will say is I actually did a game the other day um, for the Nottingham Lions and the, the Nottingham Lions Blackburn game. Actually, I didn't notice <laughs> after after a little bit. You know, I was so involved in the game and what was going on on the ice, being excited about what was going on on the ice. Yeah, I, I, it kind of bypassed me that there's nobody in the building. Now let's talk about the four teams involved: Nottingham Panthers, Sheffield Steelers, um, Coventry Blaze, and Manchester Storm. What have you made of the the recruitment side of it? And I, I want to get your view on the draft as well because that was a big thing that, that, that created a lot of excitement that night. What did you make of all that? Oh, the draft was brilliant. It was absolutely fantastic. You know, Tom Kelman, um, you know, thought it was, I spoke to him that night, actually, and we, we had an excitable conversation about how much fun it had been and how much he'd enjoyed doing it. And for those of us that, that like North American sport, the draft is still something that's, you know, it, it doesn't sit easily on, on some level with us because it's something we've never done within Britain. But the razzmatazz and the excitement and, you know, Danny Stewart not unmusing himself often enough, but Danny Stewart having an encyclopedic knowledge of everybody who he was signing. You know, uh, Guy Doucette answering calls midway through, talking about this, that and the other. Uh, teams talking about trading picks whilst it was all going on. There was something brilliantly uh, higgledy-piggledy, a little bit messy and bare bones for everybody to see. And... I tip my hat to the coaches for going on and, and doing that because that's a high pressure thing to do. I tip my hat to Todd Kelman. Um, you know, it would have been lovely if he would have had a couple of hosts in the studio that could have helped him out and, and could have talked a little bit about each one to, to have made it flow a little bit. But what, what they did was absolutely sensational. And you think about <clears throat> the challenges that you faced as a journalist, you know, over the last five years. All of a sudden now, you can create bits of content like that linking up four or five different live locations with an editing crew at another place, dropping in graphics, dropping in, you know, live video. It is absolutely phenomenal. And this is the nerdy bit of me talking now, if there isn't always a nerdy bit of me talking, but, um, you know, huge, huge for sports like ice hockey to be able to produce something like that, that is, you know, broadcast quality, if you like. It, it, it's, you can make your own programmes now that are so good. And the webcasts are, are phenomenal. Dave Burnham's going to do a fantastic job of not only delivering a great product, but also personalising them to each of the clubs that each have different needs. 
Now, as for the teams themselves, they've made quite a few um, rather interesting signings. I think it's fair to say the Norwegian league being shut down has, has certainly helped. <laughs> Are there any players that you feel might stand out, both from a British perspective and a, an import perspective? I think for, I, I'm basically interested in the Brits here because this is a this is a show that's put on for them to be ready for the World Championship. And so I'm really keen to see Liam Kirk play at that level because all of a sudden he's he's had to go down, but he's kept doing it. You know, he went to Sweden and played some junior hockey there, then he moved up and then he played with the Steel Dogs and he absolutely tore that up. He's going to move back with the Sheffield Steelers. And of course, Steelers fans will remember him as a, you know, the 16, 17 year old kid who was this great prospect. Well, he's older now, isn't he? He's on the other side of it. He's had a couple of years in the OHL. He's had a smashed face from a, a puck that went in there. He scored a ton of points. He's been to two NHL training camps. He's a different beast to the one that left this country. And I'm really, really keen to see how he does as somebody that should be an impact player in this league. Um, fascinated to see Matthew Myers as a Sheffield Steeler. I think that that's going to be fascinating. And I'm interested for Nottingham as well. You know, I'm sure Pete Russell will have been kicking chairs and tables and everything else when he heard that Ben Bounds and Jackson Whistle were going to be on the same team. Because what he would have really loved is Jackson to be on one team, Bouncy to be on the other team, and for the pair of them to be playing. Not every night. And no goalie, I think, is going to play every single night because there's just too many games. But I think if they were playing and getting the majority of the ice time with one of the teams... You know, and Nottingham just going to go 50-50 with them. They might well do that. Feels a bit sorry for Will Curling, to be honest. Um, but you do see that as being, again, another area that you're really excited about. And, you know, another player who I'm really looking forward to seeing play at senior level is Joe Hazeldine. Joe Hazeldine is a youngster. He's a 19-year-old kid who came through the ranks at Nottingham. Everybody there says wonderful things about him. I watched him play in a couple of the Lions games in this last series. And okay, the level is completely must be different, but he is an absolute stud of a defenseman. You know, he skates really well. He's got the offensive upside. He's big, he's strong. And I think he's got an awful lot about his game. You know, he's an intelligent boy, an intelligent player. And I know that Ryan Finity, having coached in that series for Blackburn, he, he saw a little bit of what Joe can do. And I think that he's going to reward him with an awful lot of opportunity. And I think that that's going to be, again, fascinating to see how a kid like him signed a three-year deal with Manchester. Can he now come into this series and actually get a top five slot or a top six slot, if you like, in, in Manchester next year, where he convinces Ryan Finity that he's worth a regular shift every single game? Now, we spoke with Mark Lefebvre earlier on in, in this edition of the BIH show, and one of the questions I put to him was regarding the import level. Now, imports are down mm. to eight for this competition. It was 14 um, in the last uh, regular season we had. I'm glad you reminded me. <laughs> it's so long ago. <laughs> now, what will that do for the Elite League in the long run, do you think? Do you think that there could be room for maybe a, a compromise where they maybe bring it down to 10 or something? How do you see that going in the future? I think it's a really good question, actually, that none of us know the answer to. Because do, do the elite league look at the model of this and say, actually, this is a goer? Financially, this is much better for us to assemble our teams in this way. And we think that we could produce a product that the crowd will want to buy. And I think it's a really interesting question. You know, I would like to see the elite league at this point start to skinny down a little bit in terms of their import levels. Um, there will be others that think that the Elite League should go absolutely the other way and maintain, at the very least, maintain where they are now. But I think the one thing that I would say is that do we want a league that reflects hockey in our country? Or do we want American League 2, DEL 1.1? You know, what is it that we're looking to create in this country? Because... If you're signing American League guys to play on your fourth line, is that really in the spirit of trying to improve hockey in the country? Also, how much does it improve the product, if you like, for the fans that turn up and watch? And it's a question, because nobody knows. Nobody knows. Because people get excited by resumes. They get excited by seeing NHL, AHL games, you know, um, DEL games, whatever. People get excited by that. How much of an impact would it have if you said, 
well, actually, we're going to sign eight, eight imports who have NHL games, but not 50 NHL games, guys that have played 400 times, guys that have played 300 times. You know, if you want to take this all the way back, think of the wonderful players who came over to British hockey back in the day. First round draft pick in Mike Blaisdell, guy that scored 20 odd goals in his rookie season with Detroit. Laurie Boschman, a guy that played tons and tons in the NHL when he played with Fife. Doug Smale, he played with Fife and um, with Cardiff. He held the record for the fastest NHL goal for absolutely donkey's years. Gary Unger, you know, all of these names that were just phenomenal players. Jimmy Pack, Kenny Priestley, guys that have won the Stanley Cup. And the question is, is it worth paying whatever amount it is to get an American League uh, fourth liner in? Or should the teams be looking at trying to bring through some young talent and maybe have the under-23s for them? And maybe, actually, if I was running a club, and Sim, I can hear Simsy just kind of say, you've got no idea. You, you don't understand. But looking at how do you mesh your education program with trying to get kids from 18 to 23, you know, is that where you now start to use your university packages rather than a guy that's going to come and play for two years and then they're going to disappear back to go and start the next phase of their life, which an awful lot of clubs have done over, over the years. But actually, do you invest it in an 18-year-old now that you're going to have for three years? You're going to take the time to really work on their skill development and you're going to improve them. Look at the Coventry Blades last year. Look at how they improved as the season went on. Look at how some of their British players improved as the season get, went on. Absolutely no surprise to me when I know that they've had a skills coach in Dale Keane working with those guys in training. And knowing Danny does all of his homework, you could see during the, the draft, Danny knew every single player that was out there and he knew exactly what they may or they may not bring to his side. And he probably drafted better than anybody else in terms of getting a full roster of what he wanted with guys that may be able to overachieve for him. And that to me is really exciting. And also knowing that he's done it with, an, with one eye on next season of maybe being able to keep some of these guys around having had a closer look at them. So if it was me, this would be a great big green light and an open door for the elite league to look at changing things. Press the reset button. I've had team owners that have expressed that to me. My question would be, do they have the balls to do it? And we'll finish with one last question, a simple one, putting you on the spot a little bit. Now, I know who you'd like to win, given you're a Yorkshireman, but who do you think will win the Elite Series? Ooh, that's a really, really tough one. Um, I wonder about the British depth in Sheffield being really strong. Um, you know, they've got some very good players there and that's going to help. I think the goaltending in Nottingham is going to be really, really good. Um, and I think Manchester have recruited some really, really interesting players. I think Danny had a great draft. So what am I saying here, Craig? What am I saying? I think I'm probably going to go with the, with the Sheffield Steelers, but I don't think it's cut and dry. You know, I think Manchester are, are going to have a really good series. I think I fancy Coventry as well. Um, but I'm gonna, I, I've got to stick with the orange. I've got to stick with the Sheffield orange, I think. Through all of this, if I don't do that, then I might get booted out of the house tonight. So uh, best not do that with the temperatures dropping. <laughs> the, whole, the whole of Yorkshire rejoices. Seth Bennett, thank you very much <laughs> for joining us on the BIA show. Pleasure to have you on board. Thank you. Thanks, mate. That was the BBC commentator, Seth Bennett, joining us on the BIA show. Thank you very much for watching. So ends episode one. We hope you've enjoyed it. We'll be available in an audio format as well. So get that from your podcast provider, Spotify and Apple among those. So all that's left is for some hockey to be played. We'll be back next week for some reaction from the first set of games taking place at the Motor Point Arena in Nottingham. My thanks to Mark Lefebvre, Alex Forbes and Seth Bennett for their time. And don't forget British Ice Hockey. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram or at Twitter at Brit Ice Hockey. Don't forget to come on the website, read the stories and reaction and blogs from the Elite Series as well. I'm Craig Anderson. Enjoy the hockey that's coming up and I'll be back with you very soon. Stay safe. I'll talk to you soon.